When the Allman Brothers Band broke out of Macon, Georgia in the late 1960s, it was as the standard bearers of a new movement known as Southern Rock. Though they remained an underground act, their distinctive sound and white-hot live shows, led by the unique guitar playing of Dwayne Allman, had built a dedicated fan base. Their music was now identifiably their sound, unique from anyone else. And I saw them, and I was, I was just, I was brought to tears. It was just so magical. I think of the top 10 shows, rock and roll shows I've ever seen in my life, the Almond Brothers got at least three or four of those. What sets them apart is their music is indescribable. It has elements of everything, but what do you call Jessica? What do you call in memory of Elizabeth Reed? They're clearly very jazz influenced, but they're not jazz songs proper. Uh, the Allman Brothers could play Stormy Monday, they could play with Albert King, B.B. King, Bobby Bland, and sound great. More so, I would say, than just about any other band of their era, but it's very limiting to call them a blues band. And that's why the Allman Brothers are the Allman Brothers. <laughs> they're a singular musical entity. The sudden death of Duane in 1971 came at a time when the band were reaching their peak and had honed their musicianship to the point where they were ready to carry the quality of their concerts into their studio recordings. It's just breathtaking in the studio. The outtakes were just, just magic. I mean, they weren't used because they were something a little more magic, but they were great. But as the Allmans started a new chapter in their story, the road ahead would be fraught with difficulty, a tale of success, loss, dissolution, and the eventual triumph of rock and roll's greatest survivors. When I met them in 1983, they were all struggling. Yet at a certain point, their legacy was gone. These days, you hear nothing about Cher, you hear nothing about Scooter Herring, you hear nothing about how bitter the breakup was in 1976. What you hear is how that band was probably the greatest live band in the history of rock. They built themselves back up to a point where today they're bigger than they, they ever were. In the winter of 1971, the Allman Brothers were a band devastated by the loss of their talismanic lead guitarist, Dwayne Allman. Tragically killed in a motorcycle accident on October the 29th, Dwayne had founded the group and raised it in his image. It had been the clarity of Dwayne's vision that had set the Allmans on an unstoppable rise to success and his peerless musicianship that had attracted legions of fans. In the emotionally fraught aftermath of Dwayne's death, the band was forced to confront the question of whether they would be able to carry on without him. Dwayne's death just knocked the air out of all of us. And that whole weekend is just kind of a daze. Uh, one of my jobs was to uh, take the family members and friends to view Dwayne in the casket. And boy, that was heart wrenching because not only my grief, but sharing everybody else's grief. And uh, then we had the funeral, which was really uplifting. That's when I, f that was my first realization that everything was going to be all right because the band played, the music was there. And uh, we came out of that funeral, if you can believe it, uh, uplifted. We had a meeting the week after the funeral and everybody agreed uh, unanimously that there was no way the band would break up, that we would continue on. And uh, within a couple of weeks, we were back in New York working. And I remember the very first date without Dwayne to see that empty spot on the stage was really strange and there was obviously a hole in the music but 
the band was still there, the music was still there, and everybody was determined to go on because they knew that that's what Wayne would have want would want. The band was going to go and start playing about three or four weeks after Dwayne had died. At first, I was surprised, but then I thought, "Hell, this is what Dwayne would want them to do." That's what always got us going was music. We played the music. Everyone felt felt good. They got along, and things were happening. And uh, so it just it was that's the only thing they could do. The people on the street that were out there in the street, and my peers, the people that were promotion people and, you know, with Columbia and RCA and all those labels back then that were doing well, ABC, they said, man, the band's, uh, Dwayne Allman is the band. I mean, you know, he's the, you know, go, you know, look here, he is the band. Well, I actually heard more than, I'm, I'm a uh, songwriter myself, so I like, I like the lyrics, you know, and Greg Allman is the best white blues singer ever, period. I mean, you know, they, people say Joe Cocker and Rod Stewart, and no, no, the best blues singer, Greg Allman. So I'm, I'm kind of saying, well, if he can carry it, <coughs> if Greg can carry it, then yeah, let's, you know, put him on the road, let's go. But whether Greg could carry it remained an open question. In trying to stabilize their career, the Allman brothers first had to address the leadership vacuum created by Dwayne's death, and bassist Barry Oakley initially stepped in to try to fill the void. After Dwayne passed away, it was impossible to expect Greg to become what he wasn't and what he had never been. You know, he was the only Allman still left in the Allman brothers' band, and people naturally assumed he was the leader, but. You know, that was just something he was not capable of doing. Barry Oakley really tried to step up and assume Dwayne's leadership mantle. And he really wasn't suited for it. He didn't have the personality for it. Plus, Barry was really getting lost in drugs and alcohol and just didn't have the, the strength to pull that off. Barry Oakley really died the same day Dwayne did. He walked around for a year, but the death of Dwayne just took every bit of his strength and soul out of him. He just spiraled down, downhill. So he's, he wasn't able to do it. Uh, Greg, for whatever reasons, grief and not being a natural leader, he couldn't take it over. And Dickie was more of a musical leader, so there was really nobody to take up the mantle of spiritual leader. And the band desperately needed to take hold of their career, which was moving fast as years of touring had seen the Ormonds develop a reputation as one of the finest live acts in America. Between 1969 and 1971, the original five piece of Dwayne and Greg Ullman drummers J-Mo and Butch Trucks, bassist Berry Oakley and guitarist Dickie Betts had released two critically acclaimed studio albums before achieving a commercial breakthrough with the live record at Fillmore East. By 72, the heat that had been progressively building around the group had taken them to the very edge of national stardom. It is sort of stunning to look back and realize that Dwayne was only with the band for less than three years. And for the first couple of years, they were slogging it out and they were such a strong live band that everywhere they went, they developed more fans. It was growing, it was growing. And just weeks uh, before his death, live at Fillmore East, uh, at Fillmore East came out and really uh, was a hit. And Dwayne knew it, he knew it was coming. Dwayne had had this unflagging enthusiasm and confidence that he kept everyone going when everyone else was, was starting to drag and lose faith. And it was just starting to happen. The vision that he had set forth to everyone was starting to come true. They were on the up of the diving board. They were diving and they were just about to, to hit the arc and, and he never really got to see that. Uh, and what had really established him was this fantastic live band that was totally rooted in the blues. Uh, but not at all a blues band. I mean, they could go anywhere with this sort of fearless improvisation of the Grateful Dead uh, with far more precision and a foot in rock and roll, a foot in country, a foot in jazz, and just doing it all beautifully in a way that didn't sound forced or contrived. 
And there was also a new record to attend to. Sessions for what would become the band's third studio album, Eat a Peach, were already underway at the time of Duane's death. And having recently achieved a commercial breakthrough with At Fillmore East, the Almonds' next release was widely anticipated. In December 71, the group travelled to Criteria Studios in Florida to work with their regular producer Tom Dowd on three new tracks that would comprise the album's first side, Ain't Wasting Time No More, Le Brer in A Minor and Melissa. Those three tracks were very critical for the band because it was going to be the first time in the studio without their leader, without Dwayne Allman. And they had a lot to prove. Uh, a lot of people didn't think they could make it without Dwayne. And this was their way of saying, yes, we can. Dickie all of a sudden showed up playing electric slide, which no one really knew he could do. And he had just never done it because that was Dwayne's thing. So that was an important element. Uh, they still had that slide guitar component. The instrumental La Brea in A minor it's really interesting because it's, it's like they recorded it expecting Dwayne to come in and add his guitar parts, except there was no place for a Dwayne Allman solo. It's, I listened to that song the other night and it's, it's just so obvious they were missing, they didn't know what to do with that absence in that song. Melissa was really the song that said, we're going to be okay. Uh, it was an old song that Greg had written back in 68 or 69. Um, and it was actually, the original recording was the first time Dwayne played slide on record. And Dickie played this really beautiful lead guitar behind the vocals that has been often imitated. It was melodic. It was just it set the mood of that song perfectly. And I think that one song really was a statement, we're not only going to survive, we're still going to be creatively viable. I got a mug here. It's that gorgeous or what, eh? And I believe I can run a decent marathon. Thank you very much. Download Veely now. Great train Each car looks the same The fact that they were able to come up with those in the immediate aftermath of Dwayne's death and their emotional devastation is quite striking. I don't think it's really fair to say that they were over it. I think what it shows is that their form of therapy was musical. They poured everything they had, all of their grief, all of their anxiety, all of their nervousness, all of their passion to continue into the music. And what came out were uh, very, very strong tracks. As the Allman's only remaining guitarist, Dickie Betts naturally assumed greater prominence. On Eat a Peach, he stepped up to take vocals for the first time, singing on his own composition, Blue Sky, in a significant step in the band's evolution. Blue Sky really mined a new direction from the Allman Brothers. He didn't want to sing it, and everyone heard his demo and was like, are you crazy? You're perfect for that. Yeah, he wrote that for Sandy Blue Sky, who, who he was dating at the time. And that song is just so filled with love and warmth. For my money, that is Dwayne Allman's greatest guitar solo. It was an important thing for the Allman Brothers because it showcased for the first time Dickie's country influences. <laughs>
It obviously opens up a whole new direction for the band. It's one that the band went heavier in because of the absence of Dwayne, and we'll never know just how much they would have continued to explore it with Dwayne. But I think what it's also interesting about Blue Sky is that it opened up new avenues of, of Dwayne's guitar playing as well, which is often overlooked. And he plays beautifully and differently than he had before. And then, of course, there's the, the fantastic harmony lines. I would have loved to have heard what Dwayne and Dickie would have done in that vein further. Capricorn Records released Eat a Peach on February the 12th, 1972. It was an instant success, peaking at number four on the Billboard chart. Although some boost in sales might be attributable to the media attention around the death of Dwayne Ullman, the critical and commercial reception given to the album suggested that the second incarnation of the Ullman Brothers Band was poised to exceed the achievements of the first. Well, the people that I was promoting to didn't even know who the Ullman Brothers or Dwayne Ullman was. So it was the music. And, um, I mean, they may have heard or read in Billboard about, you know, uh, regional band member dies in motorcycle wreck or something like that, but they didn't know anything about Macon, Capricorn. You know, it was all brand new territory. And here we come with this operatic, jazz-influenced, uh, shuffle-down, boogie southern rock, and it was not fitting in anything in the playlists that were out there at the time. It was had to go in at midnight and... And things like that because it was just totally uh, uh, 180 degrees out from what was being played. Following a tour behind Eat a Peach, the Allman Brothers returned to the studio towards the close of 72 to record a follow-up, Brothers and Sisters. Capricorn had recently ended their distribution contract with Atlantic Records, for whom Tom Dowd was a staff producer, and the band now turned to Johnny Sandlin, former drummer in Greg and Dwayne's early band, The Hourglass, to oversee the sessions. I admired Tom down immensely. I'd listen to all his records, and, I was, and especially the brothers. And uh, I liked some of his ideas I took, and then I modified them with some ideas I came up with. But it was, it was just getting the band to play right and having the tape running at the right time. And you might come up with an idea put this verse here and add, add a bridge or something, but it was nothing that totally changed the, the meaning of the song or the, or the record. But I, I, I was really proud of the time when I could bring ideas that Tom had personally given me and use them. But as work on Brothers and Sisters commenced, Sandin was called on to divide his time in an unusual fashion. Parallel to sessions with the Allman Brothers Band, he would also produce a Greg Allman solo project, Laid Back. Greg, at this point, had a set of songs that he didn't really think fit within the Allman Brothers structure. He had this new arrangement of Midnight Rider. He had Queen of Hearts, which was a very jazzy song that really, the Allman, I don't think at that point the Allman Brothers could have done. Uh, he had Multicolored Way, which was a ballad. He's, he had all these different flavorings that, you know, were sort of Almond Brother-ish, but really didn't fit into what they were doing. So I think he was actually smart to want to do a solo album. Greg Almond has always had several sides to his musical personality. And without a doubt, he submerged some of them for the sake of the Allman Brothers Band. The Allman Brothers Band was Dwayne's idea, really. Dwayne put the whole band together and then called Greg and said, I got this great band and you got to come be the singer. And he did, and he was fantastic. And Greg was the main songwriter initially. He was the only songwriter, really. And he was writing songs and they were picking songs that would fit into the Allman Brothers Band catalog. Uh, Greg wrote almost all the songs on the first album. Greg wrote almost all the songs on the second album. Dickie was just beginning to emerge. And at the same time, he was writing songs that he didn't think fit into the Allman Brothers catalog, and he was putting them aside. Greg has this folky side of him. He loved Tim Buckley, loved Jackson Brown, who was his first songwriting inspiration as a young man. They were roommates in Los Angeles. On Laid Back, he plays Jackson Brown's These Days, which Jackson has since said he had to relearn the song Greg's Way because Greg had done it from memory and actually had made up some of it. Well, I've been out walking. I don't do that much talking these days. These days, these days I seem to think a lot about 
about the things that I forgot to do for you. He wanted to go into a different area, explore a different world than what the Almond Brothers were exploring. It's a cool thing, you know, to get a great song and, and it's fun to play and fun to hear and fun to perform and uh, you play it and it goes this way and it's, it's over in four minutes and 20 seconds and on to the next, you know. It's, it's, it's a fun thing to do. So. Uh, it's not surprising that's what he wanted to do. I think that Johnny Sandlin and Greg Allman had a more clear understanding when they did Laid Back of what it was and that that was appropriate to put Greg in the foreground. The musicians were, in fact, the backing musicians, uh, which is a very different approach than the band. And I think that did affect the overall sound of Laid Back, which is a fantastic album. I think it's Greg's greatest solo work. Uh, and, and there it was almost thrown off in between <laughs> recording sessions for Brothers and Sisters. But I think that it had been building up within Greg. Playing was great, his singing was great, and I think Johnny Sandlin was there and understood it and captured it, and it's just a fantastic album that has stood the test of time. You know, from what I've been told, it was very therapeutic for him because he had that outlet, and he had a way to express his grief. You know, one thing Johnny Sandlin talks about is you know, that is a very dark album in many ways. And I think for Greg, it, it, was, it was a release. I don't remember him uh, being um, morose or, or, you know, uh, I think he was moving on. I'm certain that somewhere inside him, it was a, a wonderful way for him to move on, uh, and which his brother would have been quite pissed at him if he hadn't. The laid-back sessions also had radical implications for the Allman Brothers Band. Among the collection of musicians recruited to back Greg was a young pianist, Chuck Lavelle. Johnny Sandlin had been contemplating a means by which to reimagine the Allman sound in the post duane era, and he now suggested to Greg that they invite Lavelle to sit in with the group on Brothers and Sisters. The band agreed to give the idea a try. I was amazed at his playing, and I started using him for piano and everything I did. And he was just wonderful. He, he's, he could sit in on anything. He's about the nicest, as nice a guy as anybody could ask to meet. And things just went smoothly with him on the piano. After Dwayne died, the brothers had gone through looking possibly for another guitar player, but they weren't too, they didn't like that idea. It's just nobody could place Dwayne. And uh, Chuck showed up. And he seemed to fit in, he knew their music, he seemed to fit in, and they got him to play, and it was just natural and easy, and once, the, once he started, there was no denying it, and he was there. He had played with uh, Alex Taylor and Dr. John, who often opened shows for the brothers, and Chuck would actually set up his little keyboard without a sound system behind the stage and play along with the band, so, even though he wasn't in the band or invited to be in the band, he was playing in the band. After the laid back sessions, we had a meeting at Phil Wallen's office and the band tendered him a, an offer to join. And he was excited and accepted. And that was, again, a, it, it, it was not a new guitar player and it didn't replace Dwayne, but it added something to the music that hadn't been there before.
in the year or so that they played the five-man shows without another instrumentalist, their ability to carry on was very impressive, was, was inspiring really, but you could also hear a musical hole. And they filled that hole brilliantly with Chuck Lavelle. Chuck uh, allowed them to continue on with the harmonies, but completely different. Uh, harmonies. Instead of two guitar harmonies, you now had uh, piano and guitar harmonies, and often three-part harmonies with the guitar, the piano, and Greg's organ. And something that's often overlooked is in that transition to Chuck Lavelle, Greg actually became quite a bit more involved musically. If you listen to Greg's organ parts, they're becoming much more intricate than they were before. He's not just playing a pad, he's playing a part of a three-part harmony, which is a very complex thing to do. Work on Brothers and Sisters was paused at the beginning of November 72 as the band renegotiated their contract with Capricorn Records and made their debut television appearance on Don Kirshner's In Concert. Less than two weeks later, however, disaster befell the brothers once again. In a scarcely believable twist of fate, Berry Oakley was killed in a motorcycle accident, just a few hundred yards from the site of Duane's death. Barry had been on a downbound train since Dwayne's death. The drugs and alcohol and the grief were just eating him alive. But he had also been the social director of the band. And that particular weekend, he had planned an event with the road crew and the band wives. They were gonna have a, a jam session and a show at a local nightclub. And in the preparation for it, he was out on the bike with Kim Payne. And within a very near radius to where Dwayne's accident was, he had an accident. He did not make a turn in the, on his motor and he hit the side of a city bus. And uh, he went back to the big house. He refused to go to the hospital. He said he was okay. And as he got back to the big house, he immediately, uh, his condition uh, worsened and he was taken to the uh, emergency room and uh, he did not survive. He had fractured his brain and was hemorrhaging and what the doctor said was they there was nothing they could have done even if he had gone to the hospital immediately after the accident. And I'll never forget Kim Payne looked back and saw this and this very brutal thought flashed through his mind. It's like, oh shit, there we go again. I remember the last time I talked to him, he'd call me in the afternoon, say, uh, some of us are going down to whatever the, the local bar we were going to then, to jam. I want you to come down there and sit in with us. And I said, all right. And, I was, and uh, I was planning to go down there and jam with him, but. That afternoons when I got called to the hospital again for Barry. There were some very eerie similarities between Dwayne's death and Barry's death. Obviously, they were both on motorcycles. Dwayne was traveling down Hillcrest Avenue in Macon. He passed Iverness and then hit a truck at the intersection of Bartlett. Barry was going up Napier Avenue which runs parallel to Hillcrest. He had just passed Bartlett Avenue and he hit the bus at the intersection of Iverness. So these crashes happen about a thousand yards apart. You know, both Dwayne and Barry were 24 at the time and the accidents happened exactly a year and 13 days apart. So it was, you know, to a lot of people in the Brotherhood, it was just a very spooky coincidence of how these two accidents almost paralleled one another. Coming so soon after the death of Duane, the Ormonds were hit even harder than they had been 13 months earlier and were now overwhelmed by a sense of compound loss. But once again, they pledged that they would continue Drummer J-Mo's childhood friend Lamar Williams took over on bass, and the band completed work on what would become their most commercially successful album, Brothers and Sisters. 
although Barry had passed and he was such a critical member of the band, there was no stopping. That was a band that there were musicians. That's all they had. I mean, really, when it came down to it, it was their their spirit and their music. And no one even thought about quitting. I mean, that would be almost the antithesis of what Dwayne would have wanted or what Barry would have wanted. And so they, they were carrying on, and they they, were, they got the held auditions and came up with Lamar, who was a great bass player, too, and a nice guy. It was just death, 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 death. I mean, every day, who's dead? You know, Neil Craddock, a good friend of our, the Capricorn, killed on a, you know, flipped a Porsche over. And, you know, I mean, it just, it just seemed like every week that someone was the week that was close to the family, close to the Capricorn family, was dying off. So, I mean, we were just all like in shock and just, we just said, well, like, I guess maybe like soldiers in war, you know, they're so used to, you know, people and everything, they just, you know, we we're on a mission. And that's basically what we were as a Capricorn. We were on a mission. We wanted to, we wanted to stick this music up everybody's ass. And with Brothers and Sisters, Dickie Betts had clearly emerged as the band's key creative force. Save for two songs by Greg Ullman, all the album's original material was written by Dickie, who developed the country strains previously heard on Blue Sky into an integral part of the Allman Brothers sound. I think Brothers and Sisters is a fantastic album, so it's hard to pick standout tracks because the whole album is a standout. But uh, Ramblin' Man actually obviously stands on its own as their biggest hit, and it's something that doesn't really sound anything else like the band has ever done. In addition, Jessica is an all-time classic. It's just, Jessica is a song that will be heard as long as anybody's listening to music. It will be on the radio, it will be on commercials, it will be on baseball, football. It's one of the most joyous, happiest songs ever recorded. Jessica had not been there, the complexion of that entire album would have changed dramatically. You know, Jessica was another song that was sort of earmarked by Dickie's country influences. It was a purely Western swing song. And it not only gave Chuck his first real showcase, it gave Dickie an incredible showcase. I think maybe Dickie felt a little liberated. You know, he was, uh, while not the uh, designated leader, he was more or less a musical leader. Uh, there had always, he had always had that country background. He started writing more and more songs. I think probably again that he was the, the musical direction of the band. He definitely was a key driving force. You know, he would talk to me about something if Greg, if they were going in the studio, he would say, well, Greg has rewritten and, you know, changed the chord structure and rewritten and interpreted a blues song. So he would mention this to me. We might be at a restaurant or, or having a, a beer or something. And so uh, Dickie was very um, appreciative of everybody in the band and their music. And his own music, um, you know, as a writer of instrumental tunes, uh, unbelievable. One of the standout tracks to bear Dickie's distinctive musical imprint was the Allman Brothers' first hit single, Ramblin' Man. Released in September 1973 as the lead single from Brothers and Sisters, Ramblin' Man was a breakout crossover success, reaching number two on the Billboard chart and being heavily played on radio across America. Ramblin' Man was a completely new musical direction for the Allman Brothers. The only hint of what might, that it might be there was in Blue Sky, which is still quite different, but it's, it's in a similar vein. Um, I don't think the band was completely surprised when Dickie pulled 
Ramblin' Man out for these sessions because there's recordings of him showing it to Dwayne uh, as early as during the early demo sessions for Eat a Peach. So Dickie had been kicking the song around for a while. I think Dickie's interest in country music was well known to everyone in the band, so they probably weren't shocked. I think that was the first real post Dwayne Allman song. That is the song where Dickie came into his own. I can't imagine Dwayne playing on that song. And I think that was really where they turned the corner and became, in reality, this new version of the Allman Brothers Band that was led by Dickie Betts. As I traveled around the country, and we always had a car radio on in the rental cars, I started hearing Ramblin' Man about every 30 minutes on every station. I said, this is going to be a hit record. And it was Dickie's song, and it was originally thought maybe too country for the band. But uh, yeah, Dickie's, uh, Dickie's flavor was all through that album. Radio, you know, was looking for something to play off that record and couldn't find anything but Ramblin' Man, Ramblin' Man. And so that's what they played. And uh, we just got behind radio. Radio, you know, pretty much forced that off the album. So we just got in behind that and went with it, even though it wasn't the Allman Brothers sound. But it fit radio format, you know, and you can't argue with radio, when, you know, I mean, or anybody in media that's got that big of a blowback, you know, you just, you go with it, you know. And it's a lot easier to promote other radio stations once you got these plethora of radio stations on it. You know, get on this because you got 500 stations on it. Well, everybody, they all joined on then. The release of Brothers and Sisters in the summer of 1973 saw the band arrive at the absolute peak of their fame. They performed in front of expansive, sold-out audiences on a U.S. stadium tour culminating in playing the Summer Jam in Watkins Glen, New York, where a crowd numbering 600,000 watched the Allman Brothers headline what was the largest concert in history. Their new album, meanwhile, was also breaking records. Sales exceeded 750,000 copies in just three weeks, making it one of the fastest selling LPs of all time. 73 was really when they went from a big band to a super group band. The stadium shows, I mean, no one could, could uh, help but be uh, cognizant of what was going on as far as the success of the band, the crowds, the adulation, the success of the records. I used to comment how funny it was that the band would, in the 1970, would play for free or for little or no money, and they would do the same show in 1973 and be paid hundreds of thousands of dollars for it. We never got the sense that we were one of the biggest bands in America. We always considered ourselves the underdogs. We were always, you know, swimming upstream. And uh, the success of the album, like I say, but that time, you know, all the machine, you know, was rolling. The publicity, the music, the radio, uh, the articles. I mean, just everything was rolling. So basically at that point, we were just, you know, um, uh, working like you would if you were in the shoe business, you know. Fill this order, fill that order, fill that order. But with the fame came creeping issues that threatened the professional harmony of the group. Success had been accompanied by excess, with band members overindulging in drugs and alcohol. Two shows at Madison Square Garden had been arranged around a stint in rehab for Greg, who tried in vain to get a handle on his heroin addiction. Egos had started to inflate, 
and the overblown entourage that surrounded the Ullmans became increasingly belligerent, with the road crew in particular prone to throwing their weight around. Matters came to a head at a gig in Washington when Capricorn Records promotional director Dick Woolley was assaulted. Label chief Phil Walden decided to fire a warning shot and dismiss two of the band's longest serving roadies, Kim Payne and Mike Callahan. Phil had really started cracking down on the roadies because, like I say, the Allman Brothers were great, wonderful to work with, but all the roadies thought they were rock stars and acted like rock stars. So this roadie stopped me at the top of the stairs and said, you can't go back stage. And I said, well, those are my seats over there. There's my wife and Peggy and Phil and everything. I got these beers and I'm going over here. He said, no, you're not. And I said, yeah, I am. And so uh, I, I was wearing cowboy boots and had a couple of drinks myself. So I wasn't, you know, I wasn't in fight and shape. But when he, the guy hit me, then I went after him. And uh, I was, you know, one thing you want to be in a fight, you know, is, uh, uh, you know, uh, on bottom if you're going to be swarmed. And I could see the swarm coming. So I rolled over on the bottom and I'm punching this guy in the face, you know. <laughs> and, uh, and I was a pretty good puncher. Like I say, I was Taekwondo. I was, a, uh, I, was, I was a damn good fighter, if I do say so. I got a couple of trophies to prove it. From the road crew's point of view, the stage had gotten dangerous. They felt like it was even buckling to the point that one more person uh, up on stage, even a friend or family person, w would be dangerous. And they just made a complete cutoff. I just remember getting, you know, the bright lights uh, uh, and uh, someone getting me and pulling me out from underneath that pile, by this time four or five guys, big, huge guy, one of the Grateful Dead roadies, I think they had some kind of a nickname like Killer or, you know, uh, King Kong or something, but he was huge, and had me in one of these police holds, and I'm, you know, I'm, st I'm still fighting, you know, <laughs> and he saved my ass is what he did <laughs> by pulling me out of there. I thought he was going to do me harm. But he pulled me out of there, saved my life probably. That was the breaking point for taking crap, you know, from these roadies. You know, a roadie's a baggage handler, you know, or a furniture mover. So, I mean, you know, this attitude's got to cease. So that was kind of the breaking point right there. So I think he, he fired that, that night. He fired and let them know, you know, that, you know, hey, this is a business. Even though creatively and financially things were still on an upswing, uh, there were problems beginning as far as the road crew who were heavily drugged out, and I'm sh no, no one will deny that, and the pressures that they went through on these big stadium shows and outdoor shows, there was tension there. The band was uh, starting to get a little aloof, a little apart from one another. So there was kind of a, a drift beginning. But the year ended on a high, with the Allman Brothers named as Rolling Stones Band of 1973 and featured on the cover of their Christmas edition. Greg's solo album, Laid Back, climbed as high as 13 on the charts following its release in October to cap a roller coaster year in which he had married his second wife, Janice Blair Mulkey, and struggled through drug rehab. The dawn of 1974 saw his version of Midnight Rider become a top 20 hit, and the first ever Greg Ullman solo tour commenced in March. When I talk about Laid Back, I'll have to confess that is my favorite album that I've ever done. I felt like we, we had good songs and Greg was in top form, and it worked out. We had good arrangements and good players. It was an immediate commercial success. And we went on tour with Greg and a big string audience, uh, a string section and a full band and uh, scenery and lighting. It was completely different from the Allman Brothers. And it was a very big, successful tour. Unbelievable band, uh, two drummers, uh, organ, piano, two guitars, me and Scott Boyer, a five piece horn section, uh, three female background singers and uh, on we did two tours and on one of the tours was the uh, string section so at one at one any given moment on stage there was probably I think 26 
24, 26 people on stage. And, and the power of that is just a great feeling. And the tour was done on a, a really classy, high level, kind of in keeping with the spirit of the sound of the laid back album. It, 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 it's slick, you know? It's, it's slick without losing the soul. Uh, and uh, so we did all the best theaters in, in all the biggest cities. It was wonderful. You know, the Allman Brothers Band was Dwayne's vision of a group, and Greg was a piece of that, a very important piece. But it was someone's definition of what the sound should be like. You know, it wasn't Greg's vision for what his sound should be. You know, Greg always wrote songs that didn't always fit within the structure of the Allman Brothers. And his solo album and solo tour really helped him define who he was, both artistically and as a person. You know, in a way, that was Greg getting out from under the shadow of his big brother and him coming of age as a musician. I don't know if it's coincidental or not, but he seemed to be writing less material that was uh, adaptable to the Almond Brothers Band. But Greg's drug addictions were deepening. Now supplied directly by his personal assistant, Scooter Herring, he struggled to perform on stage, regularly unable to play reliably alongside the band. With the excesses and addictions came escalating tension, and the members of the Almond Brothers Band started to drift apart with the family ethos of the group increasingly looking like a utopian dream now consigned to the past. Drug use was really getting to be a problem at that point. I got a phone call in New York at the hotel that Greg had overdosed and it looked very serious. I rushed over, some other band members had gotten there before me uh, we were able to revive him and, um, you know, I don't think he realized the seriousness of it, but we did. They were all young. They all had money. They were all partying very hard. You know, I think a lot of that was them trying to deal with grief and doing it in not a not very healthy way. And there was nobody to say no. Once they came into money, it sort of took them away from their roots. You know, the first couple years, they all lived together. By 74, you know, they were scattered all over the place. When they went on tour, they would, they would rent suites for each band member and they would spend like five minutes awake and then just crash. They never saw the rooms. Butch would order five bottles of Dom Perignon and leave four of them for behind for the maid. Greg got a limo, so Dickie had to get a limo. And it just, the spirit that really propelled them seemed to get lost. It was at this point you could really start to see it beginning to unravel. I don't know that they changed so much on the basis of success. I think it's a time, it's in, and not necessarily a musical disharmony. I think it's just, uh, uh, you know, when you, how much are we going to work? What are we going to do? What are playing? Uh, are there outside influences? Uh, are there some bad habits? Are there different influences of all of these types? They play a part. Every band you read about, you know of, you go, why did they break up? And then why did they come back together? So I think everybody was aware, maybe not aware enough, and maybe not knowing exactly maybe how to help in some circumstances. The Allman Brothers Band agreed to take a break, and after a summer tour, they went their separate ways for the final four months of 1974. Dickie Betts took the opportunity to launch his own solo career, and his debut album, Highway Call, 
matched the success of Greg Ullman's laid back in breaking the top 20. Dickie's always one with surprises, and, and I, I love the music that he, he brought in. I thought, well, this is a fresh look at, at uh, more country music, and I, I loved it. And again, there again, we got to work with some very talented people. But, and Dickie was just showing us a whole different side of himself. And he is super talented. I mean, he is, his writing and, and singing's always been good, but his guitar playing is just pretty amazing. And you, you put him around these other great musicians, and it's gonna, it's gonna happen right. I love the songs and I love the music. We had fun doing it. We had late nights and we'd start like 10 at night, I think. Dickie had to watch the, I can't remember what this show, I think it was Kung Fu. It was a TV show that was on, didn't come on until nine o'clock at night and he would have to see that before he'd come to the session. Dickie Betts uh, solo debut, Highway Call, is I think a fantastic album. I would put it up there as well, recorded just after Laid Back. And these, in, in both Dickie cases and Greg's case, was their full, first solo albums and in many ways their most successful one. Highway Call shows Dickie Betts' conception of country, and it's very different than the conception of country coming out of Nashville at that time. And it's also very different than the conception of country coming out of sort of California hippies. Without a doubt, in my mind, if Dickie Betts had decided to move to Nashville and just start hanging out full time with Willie Nelson and Waylon Jennings and that crew, he could have been a linchpin of the outlaw country music. In some ways, what Dickie was doing was a precursor to the outlaw country that was just, just budding. Although again, it was distinctly different. He had this sort of rebel country rock thing. It was country music filtered through the guy who had played on live at Fillmore East, <laughs> Dwayne Allman. And of course, that was different. tell you, by then, after the Allman Brothers and the luck with, with, with Greg's album and Dickie's album, I guess he got to, got to a point, I don't mean this to sound all stuck up and all, but I thought, well, this, we have a magic thing here and it's going to keep working. Of course, that didn't keep working forever, but it would ride it while we could. And in the winter of 1974, two of the Allman Brothers band went head to head as both Dickie Betts and Greg Allman embarked on US solo tours. Wary of being in competition with one another, the two camps negotiated on venue dates and who would have their pick of available backing musicians. We tried to keep their dates to their shows from being in conflict with each other in terms of selling tickets, you know. Uh, all of a sudden, both shows are on sale in the same market you know, and they're a week apart. Well, we tried to keep them greater than a week apart and the routing to keep them as far as apart. And all of a sudden, you're crisscrossing the country and they end up maybe in the same city <laughs> on the same night. You just couldn't avoid it uh, 100%. And I think maybe a couple of times they were close and one would go over and see the other one and so forth. So my efforts to sort of separate them was not a, a personality issue so much as it was that if one was playing the same venue in the same town but four weeks apart, you know, you could just, you know, they'd have a chance to not competing with Allman Brothers band audiences for which if a public's going to make a decision. Give the, give the fans a time to get a little more jingle in their pocket, get another payday behind them, get some money in their pocket, and go see both during their solo tour. There was never any overt competition between Dickie and Greg, but I think it was covert. I think 
they couldn't help but uh, each being jealous somewhat. I don't know if jealous is the right word, but uh, not resentful, but just maybe a little professional jealousy. In the fall of 74, when Greg and Dickie were both out solo, and I obviously couldn't go with both of them at the same time. I think Dickie was feeling that maybe he was getting the uh, stepchild treatment, that Greg's tour was getting the best of the roadies. It was very diplomatic. We had to share roadies. Uh, again, I went with Dickie as maybe the senior road person, but Greg got some of the better musicians. It was, uh, it was a little chippy there. Dickie Betts was more country than rock, and he had a lot of country musicians. He was billed as Richard Betts at his request. I think maybe he confused his fan base. Uh, his tour was not nearly as successful as, as Greg's. Uh, he didn't make as much money off of it, and some, many of the shows were just not successful. I, I think there was some uh, confusion in the marketplace on that. My next guest is a very special member of the rock music scene. For the past two years, he was voted number one in the all-star rock and jazz poll. You know, he's got enough gold records to open up a chain of banks. He's also the lead singer in the great Allman Brothers Band. He's a guitarist, a composer, and he's really terrific. He's also a very good friend of mine, Mr. Greg Allman. In January 75, just a month after finalizing a divorce from his second wife, Janice, Greg Allman met Cher and the two began dating. Sessions for a new Allman Brothers album had been planned to start at Capricorn Studios back in Macon, Georgia, but Greg had moved to Los Angeles where he was ensconced with Cher. The recording process for what would become Win, Lose or Draw proved to be torturous, with producer Johnny Sandling finding it an almost impossible task to cajole the band into taking the project seriously. Everybody was separated. There were very few times when everybody was in the studio at the same time with everybody playing or, or working up tunes. And there's so-and-so would have a song, other person would have a song, and they'd put them together, but they'd work them up usually on their own. And there was no interaction between them. But it's just, uh, you know, you can see that. It just wasn't the interest on their part. I think more than anything, they weren't putting as much as the time into it or, or just much as much gift to it. Greg and, and Dickie would, would call. If they didn't want to go, they didn't go. If they didn't want, like when the session was, they wouldn't go or they wouldn't show up. And this was much worse on, on Greg than it was Dickie. But I don't know if Capricorn had anything to do about it. They were trying to get a record out, the record company was, and, and it seemed like the only way to do it was to put up with this Nonsense, really. To compound all that, <clears throat> during those sessions, Greg started dating Cher, who was the biggest television star in Hollywood, and not only kept Greg in L.A. during those sessions, but kept the two of them on the cover of every tabloid in your supermarket checkout line. So for a large part of that session, Greg was not even in Macon. And at a certain point, Johnny sent tapes to LA for Greg to do his vocals. And what happens? Greg cuts his vocals when he has a cold. That Win, Lose, or Draw album was just a disaster from every angle you look at. It. You could just see the end was not far off. Win, Lose or Draw was released in August 1975 after months of arduous sessions. Though the Allman's popularity ensured that sales held up, reviews were largely negative, with some critics floating the notion that the group was out of time. Okay, this isn't Brothers and Sisters, but yeah, it's, it still has some great music. Uh, High Falls, it's just a brilliant instrumental that, that Dickie put together. 
Win, Lose, or Draw was a great song that Greg wrote. Uh, he wrote it about a friend of his who had done time in prison, but the band butchered it, and Greg recorded it with a cold, so his vocals were not what they should have been either. Looking back on that album, it really wasn't very good. <laughs> you know, it, it was, the Allman Brothers band was running on fumes. The Win, Lose, or Draw tour, fall of 75, started off with a bang. We opened up the Superdome, the first concert in the Superdome, but as the tour progressed and the album was not doing as well. We were having more and more performances that were lackluster. J-Mo was having back problems again. Uh, I could definitely see things slipping away. And by the end of the tour, we actually canceled a couple of shows and uh, it just, it was not a successful tour financially. When the tour concluded, the legacy of Greg's drug use came to wreak havoc on his entire world. Scooter Herring, Greg's assistant and dealer, was arrested on drugs charges. Herring was loosely associated with the Dixie Mafia, a large-scale organized crime outfit that operated across the southern states. And the FBI swiftly came for Greg, pressuring him to incriminate Scooter and hand them leverage in their attempt to break the Dixie Mafia. Greg agreed to cooperate, and Scooter was sentenced to 75 years in a federal penitentiary. Greg was given immunity, and he was told, you know, if you don't testify the way we want you to, you're going to end up doing a lot of time in federal prison with long blonde hair. <laughs> At the time, the band didn't really understand, and to the whole Allman Brothers persona, you know, to turn on one another was was just unacceptable. And, and the whole band at that time didn't understand Greg's position. And I, I among them, I thought he was a rat, but I came to understand that he didn't really have a choice. When the whole power of the federal government is on you, there's just not much you can do. After Scooter was convicted, <clears throat> Greg was getting death threats from within the Brotherhood. Uh, people were very angry incredibly angry. J-Mo wrote a letter to the editor, to the Macon Telegraph, basically saying he was no longer going to play with Greg. He couldn't play with Greg because Greg had betrayed someone who was very dear to them all. Uh, Dickey, shortly thereafter, said the same thing. You know, Greg betrayed the Brotherhood. He betrayed Scooter. There's no way I can ever play with him ever again. Butch came out and said the same thing. Greg, on the other hand, was trying to explain to them, hey, I didn't have any choice. There was a band meeting shortly after the trial. Dickie refused to even speak to Greg. And shortly thereafter, the band broke up. Uh, it was very bitter. I mean, it was very publicly played out. And it was basically confirming all the rumors that had been flying for the last two years that they were on the verge of, of splitting. And, you know, what finally drove them to that point was a Scooter Herring trial. As the Allman brothers' personal relationships collapsed, warning signs started to flush around their business affairs. Evidence emerged that Capricorn Records, the label founded by Phil Walden in order to sign Dwayne Allman, had been underpaying the band. 
a series of financial issues now converge to heap pressure on both the band and their label. At the end of the 1976 tour, the early part of 76, when I tallied all the uh, debits and credits and remaining cash balance, I found out that the tour had really been a disappointment. Uh, it showed a profit, but it was a meager profit. The band members individually were still comfortable and uh, they weren't ever broke, but it was a big disappointment corporately. And uh, I always used to joke that that last tour was, I call it the brother-in-law tour because everybody had their relatives, their friends, their family. We had a bloated payroll. The band had taken like a year off during that recording, paying everybody full salary, which is unheard of. Um, but the road crew and the band, everybody. It was just like we took a year off and no income and all out go. Dickey hired his own accountant to audit the royalty statements. And he filed an arbitration case saying he was owed at least $200,000. Next up, Johnny Sandwin sued Capricorn, saying he was owed over $800,000. And at the same time, the breakup of the Allman Brothers band devastated Capricorn, because that was their cash cow. People started not receiving the checks they were expecting. Alimony payments that were due were not getting paid. Child support was not getting paid. During this time, Phil signed a deal with Polygram Records and ultimately borrowed, I think, $8.8 .8 million to keep the label going. As security, he put up the Capricorn catalog, their recording contracts, even the studio, thinking this thing's going to turn around and, you know, and it didn't turn around. The bottom basically fell out of what was commonly known as Southern Rock. Um, they had also had a relatively unsuccessful album, and the record royalties had uh, begun to diminish. Things change, um, but if you become set in your way and you hear something that's a little bit different, um, and you sort of reject it, you know, just uh, immediately, then you're asking to be kicked in the rear by the public as the music changes. And there was an opportunity, for example, to get involved with Dire Straits from Capricorn's Records point of view. Might not have ever happened, but it was not something that Phil really heard. So around that time period at my agency, I was bringing in 999 and Gang of Four and, uh, and Squeeze and uh, the police, and Phil was pretty much stuck in one place musically. And I think that's the difference. I think he, he, he sort of shut off, uh, you know, in that uh, journey of finding some new sounds and some new music. Well, it was all cocaine. Everybody, you know, Phil was just, you know, he was doing probably three, four hundred dollars worth of coke a day. His decision-making capacity was diminished by seventy percent. So he was basically working on about thirty percent of his intellect and capacity. And the only thing I remember is, you know, Phil making bad decisions, buying, you know, Magritte's and you know, thirty thousand dollar paintings here and. In the meantime, he's going through a couple thousand dollars a week in cocaine. Last time I saw Phil, he was on his hands and knees trying to snort up a piece of cocaine that had dropped in a rug with a straw. And, uh, you know, I said, this, this is not good. I got to get out of here. With the band dissolved in the labeling crisis, Dickie Betts successfully sued to get out of his contract with Capricorn and signed to Arista Records as a solo artist. Greg, now father to a baby boy with Cher, continued to pursue his own solo career, though drug and relationship problems persisted. In the winter of 1977, he released an album of duets with Cher, To The Hard Way. Billed as Allman and Woman, 
For many critics, the record represented the absolute nadir in Greg's declining fortunes. I thought it was a very, very strange idea. But, you know, who knows, sometimes those kind of off-the-wall ideas work. And I was hoping it would. I was hoping it would do good. I don't think it made the charge, but I don't know. But <laughs> it was fun to make, but it wasn't a great album. Cher was just wonderful to work with. She was together, she was professional, and and I really liked her. You know, I thought she was a sweet, sweet girl. And I was proud to work with her. If you ever go, darling, I'll be That album could have been the greatest thing since Abbey Road, and people would not have given it a chance. Greg and Cher were on the cover of National Enquirer every week, um, the supermarket tabloids. Johnny Carson was making jokes about them on The Tonight Show. And Gary Trudeau made fun of them in Doonesbury. I mean, that's... Greg and Cher had pretty much turned into a laughing stock. I mean, everyone loved to make fun of Greg. And I think it not only damaged his reputation, his merit as an artist, I think it also really diminished the Allman Brothers band to the point where no one was talking about the music. No one was talking about the incredible albums that they made with Dwayne Allman. They were not talking about the spirit of that band. All of a sudden, Greg Allman was that coked up singer who's married to Cher and, oh yeah, and the Allman Brothers are his backup band. And that's what it became. And I think it took them 25 years to get over that. During all these years, Greg had been lost for the, for the whole time. And it had to be worse after the thing with Scooter and all. It just had to be worse. I mean, everything was kind of folding in on itself now. On the subsequent tour, Cher brought an end to her turbulent relationship with Greg Ullman and left the troubled singer in the final weeks of 77, taking their son with her. With royalty payments from Capricorn having dried up, the other members of the Allman Brothers band were broke and struggling to meet their debts. The reason for the band's split, Scooter Herring, had had his conviction overturned and his sentence reduced from 75 years to 30 months. Gambling that their attitude towards him would have softened, a penitent Greg approached his former bandmates to suggest a reunion. Only Chuck Lavelle and Lamar Williams declined. Cher filed for divorce. And as much as that had been a sanctuary for Greg, I think in the end that felt like a trap because the first thing he did was he flew back to Macon and he was determined to put the Allman Brothers Band back together. Unfortunately, you know, Chuck and Lamar and J-Mo had started their own band called Sea Level. J-Mo was back in the fold with the Allman Brothers, but Chuck and Lamar elected to stay with Sea level They brought in two guys from Dickie's solo band, Dan Toller on guitar, David Goflies on bass, and, you know, that further changed their sound. I think that the loss of Chuck Lavelle and Lamar Williams didn't immediately seem to hurt the band, 
they were replaced capably. David Goldfleece was a very solid bass player, had been playing with Dickie Betts in Great Southern and understood what Dickie wanted and was able to fit in musically. Danny Toller is a fantastic guitar player, again, had been playing with Dickie and knew what he wanted and was able to fit in. And in the original reincarnation of the band, it all seemed to work pretty well. But there was a certain level of intuitiveness that was lost. And every step away from the original band, and although Lamar Williams and Chuck Lavelle, of course, never played with Barry Oakley and Dwayne Allman, they were direct links back to that. And each step away from that hurt the band. And I don't think it was immediately apparent. It wasn't that there was a steep musical fall off, but there was a residual effect that over time came to impact them more and more. In February 1979, the reconciled, reconfigured Allman Brothers Band traveled to Criteria Studios in Miami to reunite with producer Tom Dowd and begin sessions for what would be their sixth studio album, Enlightened Rogues. We were really optimistic. The, uh, there was a new manager, been involved with, uh, with uh, Dickie and the uh, American Indian Foundation. So Enlightened Rogues, we had a great, great anticipation for its success. When they hired Tom Dow to do the comeback album, I th firmly believe that was an acknowledgement by the Allman Brothers that we went off track. We went down a path that wasn't particularly good for the band. And another thing they did, which was very interesting, is they all lived under the same roof while they were recording that album. They were really trying to get that spirit of the brotherhood back. And I think for a while they got it. Um, Enlightened Rogues was very well received critically. It had a lot of fresh energy to it, a lot of vitality. And it was everything that win, lose, or draw wasn't. A lot of people still love the album. I find it to be good, but not great. I don't love it. Uh, but I think it was a very successful in the sense that it sounded like the Allman Brothers band. It sounded like we're gonna be back to who we were. We're not gonna be this uh, tepid band that petered out. We're back, we're strong, we're here. And they went out and took it on the road and they their original shows in 1979 and 1980 were very strong. And there was a very powerful sense amongst the fan base and amongst the band themselves that they were back and that they could do this again. missing on that album was someone to creatively challenge and creatively motivate Dickie as a guitarist. Sometimes Dan Toller did a solo, but most often it was Dickie did a solo. When, you know, it was vocals, Dickie solo, back into vocals. And there was none of that beautiful interplay that had marked the early years of the Allman Brothers. But despite breaking the top 10 on the Billboard chart and generating a hit single in Crazy Love, Enlightened Rogues came too late for Capricorn Records, which finally ran out of money 
filed for bankruptcy in October 79. When Light and Rose was released, Capricorn was struggling. And they saw that album and the reunion of the Allman Brothers as that was going to pull them out of their troubles. But even as the Allman Brothers were on tour to support that album, which did go platinum, by the way, Polygram called up Capricorn. Um, you owe us about five and a half million dollars, and we want that today. And Capricorn, of course, didn't have that money and went into bankruptcy. And Polygram wound up with the Capricorn catalog, all their recording contracts, all their artists, everything. With the final demise of Capricorn, the Allman Brothers signed a new deal with Arista Records where label head Clive Davis had a vision to remodel and update the band's sound. The consequences were disastrous. The two albums released on Arista, Reach for the Sky in 1980 and Brothers of the Road in 81, were considered by the Allman Brothers themselves to be the worst records that they had ever issued. Critics shared that sentiment and widely derided Arista's attempt to crowbar the band into traditional song forms, overlaid with glossy modern production. To add to their difficulties, between the two albums, J-Mo departed the group in a dispute over money, and another founding band member was lost. They had signed with a new record label, and the idea was afoot that they should be competing in the marketplace of current music. And it didn't work out very well. But to be fair to the Allman Brothers, and I guess to some extent even to Arista, that's what people were doing at the time. It wasn't unique to them. The idea was, if you want to compete, you have to modernize a little bit and get away from doing things the old way. So they weren't unique in that regard, but they also weren't unique, on the other hand, in having the strength and ability to say, no, this is not what we're going to do. We're the Allman Brothers. This is what we're going to do. They tried to play the game, and it, it didn't work out very well. reaching an age in the evolution of popular music where guitars were not cool. Guitar solos were not cool. This was the age of synthesizers, punk, new wave. And Arista tried to get the Allman Brothers to make a turn and into that. And that was one of the dumbest things that's ever happened in the history of music to me. Brothers of the Road is not better than its original <laughs> reputation implies. And to some extent, every band has a couple of records in their history if they've been around long enough that you wouldn't really listen to. And that's where these two records fall for me. So uh, if you're writing a history of the band, you gotta spend a little bit of time <laughs> listening to them. If you're not, I don't know why you would really listen to these records. They're, they're not good. They're sort of sad statements of a, a once proud and great institution falling apart and losing its way. Her album was about getting a hit single. Straight from the heart charted, so they reached that goal. What that song had to do with the Allman Brothers band escapes me. Rolling Stone, I thought, had the perfect review, and what they wrote was, 
all the Allman Brothers Band can do right now is give people a lingering suspicion that they stole their name. After a half-hearted tour, the Allman Brothers dissolved for the second time in the early weeks of 1982. The band members now found themselves cast adrift in an unfamiliar world of synth pop and corporate rock, a landscape unrecognizable to the icons of the 60s and 70s, almost all of whom struggled badly during the 80s. Greg Allman put a band together and went out on tour, but his profile had collapsed so precipitously that he struggled to play anywhere larger than bars, and not a single record label was willing to offer him a recording contract. The 80s were a very dark period for Roots music. Synthesizers were huge at this point. If you played guitar, you were not cool. If you played a guitar solo, you were self-indulgent. You know, the 80s were about disco and pop, and there was no blues influence at all. And there was not a lot of musicianship. And you know, Dickie was playing bars, J-Mo was playing bars, and Greg was playing bars. You know, they were no longer playing stadiums. They could barely fill up a 500-seat bar. As an illustration of how far they had fallen, I spent a year playing in a band with J-Mo. You know, and it was sort of, how did the universe allow something like this to happen? I mean, it was a great experience for me, but why is J-Mo playing in this little bar and making in a cover band? I was in an early retirement. I was just having a good old time. <laughs> and I got a phone call in late 1983, and it was Greg Allman. And he said, would you consider coming back to work with me? And I said, why, hell yes. And I, when I hung up the phone, I literally jumped up in the, in the air off the, off the floor because this is what I really wanted to do. And uh, I went to see the Greg Allman Band in Jacksonville, Florida. And I was shocked because I was used to stadiums and arenas and he was playing a nightclub with maybe 200 people. So we've been playing all to the summer, uh, like at, at real large nightclubs now. They're building some big clubs now because these arenas just doesn't seem like very many people are making any kind of money because you go into a, an arena <clears throat> or a ballpark or whatever, and you have four, five, six acts. I mean, the ticket's going to cost you anywhere from twelve to twenty dollars, and uh, people just don't have that kind of money nowadays. I plan on uh, we plan on cutting an album, hopefully to have maybe a January or February release. Uh, it's not for sure, but uh, that's what we'd like to aim for. And uh, we have a lot of it written. He sounded better than ever to me. But he had no record deal. He had tremendous tax problems. All the stuff that happened after he left the, uh, the Macon, Georgia scene. Uh, and it was uh, really shocking <laughs> to me that how low he had fallen professionally. Not, not personally, uh, but professionally. And he did have personal problems, too. He still had a tremendous alcohol and drug problem. Is Greg Allman going to hit the... Uh, don't take this wrong. Is Greg Allman going to hit the heights that you've seen in the past? Well, if I don't, it won't be because I didn't try. There's always a, a little bit of a... You know, a little bit of a preference or bias at the record labels to find the new, you know, 18-year-old. Uh, so it's a disadvantage if you've been around a while. And a couple of record A&R guys who were friends of mine and loved the Allman Brothers said some pretty, you know, uh, not nasty, just sort of quips that, you know, I, I don't need a used tire or whatever, you know. I mean, just stuff that kind of... It's like, really? Don't you understand? <laughs> you know? But in 1986, fate intervened to revive Greg's flagging fortunes. He encountered a composition by a little-known English songwriter entitled I'm No Angel. And on the strength of a demo of the song, Greg Allman was offered a deal by Epic Records. Greg said something to me. He said, I really want to hear my music on the radio again. 
And that really struck a chord with me. And I said, you know, damn it, I'm going to do my best that, uh, to see that that does happen. And after about four years, it did. But it was a long, a long, hard slog to get people to give him another chance. We were booking uh, uh, Dickie Betts, my agency. We were booking uh, Greg Allman. And uh, I, I de decided that it, it you know, might be in, you know, a good thing to work with Greg and let him rebuild you know, kind of you know, from the ground up. He liked to play, and he had the Toller Brothers who would uh, put together some instrumental tracks, and Greg could write lyrics to those in instrumental tracks. I don't know if Greg would remember this, but I listened to uh, not hundreds, but probably thousands of songs that people would send or own albums, obscure albums or new albums, and I almost became in myself sort of in a bubble of looking for a song for Greg. But a guy um, sent this cassette out to a number of people, uh, songwriters do that, and publishers do that, and I uh, heard uh, I'm No Angel. written by uh, a guy from the UK, but it sounded almost autobiographical for Greg. And we all felt, man, this is a hit song. And the folks at Epic Records called us back and uh, one of the radio promotion guys said, I can get this song on, a, on 200 radio stations. So based on that, they made us an offer. And uh, we signed Greg with Epic and it was a, a big success. It was, uh, we had probably four tracks that were number one at AOR, album oriented songs. Uh, it was the number nine MTV video, I'm No Angel, and it was a gold record. So we were back in the ball game. Greg's resurrection coincided with a wider rehabilitation of lead guitar and blues based rock towards the end of the 80s. Stevie Ray Vaughan, the virtuoso guitarist from Texas, was creating waves across the music world with his searing modern brand of electric blues, and audiences were reawakened to the sounds and styles of Southern rock. Stevie Ray, with his guitar, stepped into that arena he was not in vogue to be a guitar player and be on a label and think you were going to have a shot. And Epic Records printed the grand total of 10,000 albums in the beginning. And they've sold like in a matter of minutes or days or hours. I mean, it was a week or so and they were gone. And the code number changed and they reissued and they got busy really fast and they did the bottom line and it got up a lot of attention. Mick Jagger came to that show. But Stevie was, uh, was definitely a bridge to uh, a new acceptance for, you know, a guitar band. Dickie always talks about how Stevie Ray Vaughan really kicked open the door again and made it cool to be a guitar player. It made it cool to play blues-based music. And as a consequence of the new favorable climate, the Allman Brothers Band reformed once again. Greg Allman, J Mo, Butch Trucks, and Dickie Betts reconvened as the nucleus of the group, while highly regarded guitarist Warren Haynes and pianist Johnny Neal came across from Dickie's solo band, and Alan Woody joined on bass. In the summer of 89, Polygram released the Dreams box set, a compilation of recordings from across the band's career and prehistory that attracted universal critical praise. To capitalize on the success of Dreams, 
the Ormonds embarked on a triumphant 20th anniversary tour of America. Because of the new technology, known as the CD, the record business was plundering its own vaults, reissuing things and putting together box sets. The Dreams box set, which was compiled in large part by Kirk West, was brilliant. It was one of the real paragons of the art form of the box set. It reestablished their greatness. It put it into a context. It allowed a certain number of outtakes and behind the scenes looks. And it was obvious that the time was right. It was friendlier time for them to get together. I remember JMO called me up one day and he said, good things come to those who wait. And I was like, what do you, what do you, what do you mean? We're getting back together. The happiness and glee in his voice, you could hear it in every word he said. He, it was like going home, and it was like that for all of them. I don't think it was clear to anyone at that point that it would be more than a 20th anniversary tour. Uh, the, it was certainly put together with the concept that if it works, if everyone can stand each other, if the music is good, if he can regain a bit of that vitality that the band had in its heyday, yes, let's keep going. They brought in Warren Haynes on guitar, and they brought in Alan Woody on bass. And Warren was stepping into Dwayne's chair, and he was up for that challenge. Warren was smart enough to evoke Dwayne in his solos, but he was also good enough to where he could bring his own voice. And they gave the Allman Brothers Band something they hadn't had since the days of Chuck Lavelle. And that is a first-class improv soloist who could really take them back to where things were with Dwayne when they went on stage. You didn't know what was going to happen. The tour was pretty successful, so it was stepping back up into that uh, into that you know uh, uh, level that they'd seen uh, before, and it, and there was a lot of uh, energy and, and and acceptance for it. Was everything you know? Were they really creating the 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 new legacy? That that'll be a, others to decide. But uh, it was a fun tour. For the revitalized band, the 90s were a rich era. With the 80s firmly consigned to history, music listeners were keen to look back and discover key artists from rock and roll's heyday. Together with a series of successful studio albums released over the course of the decade, the Allman Brothers' incredible legacy was finally recognized with induction into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in 1995. The beautiful part of the comeback was the Allman Brothers didn't just bring back their old fans. There were a lot of people just like me that just stopped listening to them because it just it wasn't the Allman Brothers band anymore. The 90s, they not only recaptured their legacy, they pretty much stole the show at Woodstock in 1994. They did an incredible unplug show on MTV that was highlighted by this acoustic version of Elizabeth Reed. It was just mind-blowing. They released two incredible studio albums. All of a sudden, they became legitimate again. They became a band that mattered. I was surprised somewhat that it lasted as long as it did. I mean, when in, the 19, in 1970, we were wondering if we could make it into the next year. And then, it, and then 1989 came and went, and then all through the 90s and up until just now recently. It, uh, a little surprised, but not uh, not all that much. There's a second generation of fans, and their fan base, their original fan base, is just amazing. They're, uh, I'm amazed. I'm, I probably get 100 emails a day uh, or fo Facebook inquiries about, 
you know, the band, and uh, there, there are people who still live and breathe at 24-7 that band. But as sweet as the comeback may have been, the Almonds still had one last bitter pill to swallow. Dickie Betts had not resolved the personal problems that had so blighted the lives of many of his associates over the decades, and his erratic behavior had begun to affect the band's ability to function at their top level. In May 2000, Dickie was fired from the Allman Brothers. It was stunning news to those of us who paid a lot of attention to the band. It was impossible to imagine the band without Dickie Betts. I, among many others, was skeptical of their ability to perform without Dickie. Dickie was very clearly, and all the more so, especially after the reunion in 1989, the band leader on stage. I think if anybody had dropped into a show from Planet Mars and knew nothing about the Allman Brothers, they would assume he was the, he was the guy, he was the band leader. After the Allman Brothers induction into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in 1995, that was sort of a low point for Greg. He was really a mess. He checked himself into rehab the next day. And it was not a straight line in Greg's recovery. It was a lot of zigging and zagging and falling off the wagon. But he began to get better. And as he began to be in better shape, he wanted to assert himself at some times. And there were tensions. Dickie had a pattern in which he would fall off the wagon and go on drinking binges. There had been an incident where Warren and Al Alan Woody, they had their own band, Government Mule. They had signed to the reformed Capricorn Records. That upset Dickie. They had a band meeting, and what I was told was a fist fight broke out. Warren and Alan left the band. Um... There were instances you can hear on a, a live album they released, Dickie's playing got very sloppy. And at a certain point, they just got tired of it. I think that Dickie thought it was impossible for him to be fired, and his behavior was as such. Dickie probably thought Maybe everybody thought, until the very moment that they decided to perform without Dickie, that the most inevitable thing to happen would be they would break up again. Maybe take a break for a couple of years and get together again. That had been the pattern. Um, but they had different ideas this time, and they decided to try to perform without him. With the loss of Dickie Betts searing lead playing, the band now reconfigured around two outstanding talents. Warren Haynes returned to the fold after the sudden death of his government mule bandmate and former Ullman's bassist, Alan Woody, while Butch Truck's young nephew, Derek, a guitar prodigy who had first come on board in 99, now became the focus of the group. Greg personally called Warren up, asked him to come back, and Warren agreed to come back for the Beacon Shows in March of 2001 as a special guest. He was not at that point a member of the Allman Brothers. His agreement was basically, I'll see how it feels <laughs> and how these shows go. And they were a triumph, and he rejoined the band. It was a very unexpected turn of events. Without, this, without Warren Haynes returning to the Allman Brothers, it's hard to imagine how they would have been able to continue without Dickie Betts. I think it was a superb lineup that was rivaled only by the Chuck Lavelle lineup, and then the, the comeback in 1990 with Dickie and Warren. You know, Derek just brought something special to that band. I remember I was living in Macon, and Chuck Lavelle called me up, and, and he was like, Butch Truck's nephew is playing this little bar, and you know, I'm going to go see him. You need to come. You need to hear him. He's 11 years old. And I, I remember it was like, Seriously? You're, you're, you want me to go see an 11-year-old kid? And we went to the bar, and Derek's Gibson SG was taller than he was. He spent the entire show with an Atlanta Braves cap, hiding his face pretty much. And I stood there with Chuck with my jaw dropped open. Kid was 11 years old and playing like that.
I think his presence really enabled them to go to new heights and to continue performing as a group. If they hadn't had him on hand, I'm not sure what they would have done. In March 2009, the band celebrated their 40th anniversary with a show at the Beacon Theatre. And on the same stage five years later, the curtain fell for the last time, as on the 28th of October 2014, the Allman Brothers Band played their final gig. Having restored themselves to the summit of esteem within the music world and achieved the recognition that had deserted them during the 80s, the Ormonds bowed out as one of the great comeback stories of the millennium. What they've done is unheard of in the music business. They have a music career. They didn't have to go into films or uh, do a TV show. You know, they uh, rent, rent the Beacon Theater in New York every year for 30 days sell it out within 10 minutes, uh, and here it is 40, 45 years later. My God, I mean, I've never heard of that in the business. There's a whole new generation of children of children from the <laughs> from the 60s that are into this band now. A lot of us are growing older, some of us much older, but uh, the, to me they could go out and and do it again, you know. I, it's not beyond my dreams that Dickie Betts could maybe come back for one more run, you know. Who knows? Never, uh, never ever underestimate the longevity of the Allman Brothers band continue through deaths, drug issues, breakups, marriages breaking up, and everything else that they endured and continued through is a strong message about the power of perseverance. I think that it's something that should resonate with people who love the band and people who don't even know anything about the band. Everybody in their life faces hard times. Few people face as much difficulty in hard times as the Allman Brothers. And their ability to persevere, continue on, and, and keep moving with their heads up in a positive direction, I think is very inspiring and something that everybody should take a little bit of inspiration from. Coming out of the 70s, the Allman Brothers band had lost everything that it once was. With the reunion, going on tour with Derek Trucks and Warren Haynes, they got that back. And not a lot of people can say that. And I think that's very important because that band was once the best band America had to offer. And I think that's a very important legacy and it's one that was forgotten. I think the fact that it's now back again, you know, that, that's the way the story should end.